Good morning, afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to a new series of the Financial Geography Online Seminars. Um, I was just saying to the other people involved in the organization, it seems like forever since we had one, but actually we had one quite late in June, but it just, just seems like it's it's much more than just a few months ago. But I'm happy that we're back with the new series. Uh, as you may have seen online, otherwise I will put it in the chat later on, we have a, a new series being announced. We haven't announced all the lectures yet. There's still a few that were at this moment, uh, almost at the same time, there's emails coming in and out as we're starting now to set the last few dates. But we have announced the first three speakers and then we have announced the fourth speaker closer to Christmas and one or two in between, we're still uh, completing the details. So I'll tell you more about that at the end as well, uh, but you can check that out. But we're very happy to have uh, Daniel Sanfelici as one of our, of our first speaker, not one of the first speakers, the very first speaker of the new season. So he will present today on the financial industry set site on institutional investors, a relational approach to property investment outsourcing in Brazil. You must have all seen this title since you've registered. So Daniel is a professor at the Federal Fluminense University and a researcher at CNPQ. He carries out research in the field of urban studies and economic geography. And currently he leads a research project on the role of financial and corporate investors in Brazil's commercial real estate market. I'm very excited that he's going to be our first speaker. And Daniel, the floor is yours. And the question uh, to everyone you. else to mute their microphones. Thank you so much, Manuel. Um, I'm, I'm gonna share my my screen. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for for the invitation. Uh, afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's an honor for me to be here in the in the Fingeo uh, seminar, seminar virtual seminar ser series. And uh, what I'm going to present today is a paper that. I has just been accepted by economic geography. I wrote it with uh, Myra Magnani, who is here too. She's a PhD student at the University of Le Chatel in Switzerland. Uh, and it's about uh, the outsourcing of property investments by Brazil's uh, pension funds. So just to give you a, a, a context uh, in the literature uh, and uh, pension funds have you know, have recently emerged as major uh, players in global financial markets uh, as they have uh, more and more reserves. And uh, in line with this uh, growth, there is an expanding investment industry that has uh, flourished uh, with the growth of uh, these reserves, especially by supplying a range of financial products and financial services to to, this, uh, to these types of investors. Uh, economic geographers, they have documented and analyzed the evolving relationship between pension funds and financial intermediaries, but less is known about the concrete efforts made by this industry to attract pension fund money into specific investment vehicles, especially in the global south. So this paper is more uh, concerned with the with these efforts, that is to say, how this industry attracts the money from pension funds uh, to then invest uh, in uh, in property in in Brazil. So we claim that there are, there are key insights that could be gained from from understanding how uh, uh, the emerging power uh, relations between asset managers and asset owners shift investment flows in space. And we seek to fill this gap by uh, looking at the relationship between uh, pension funds and the financial industry in Brazil, but in particular uh, of, of REITs, real estate investment trusts, which are called fundos imobiliários in Brazil. Uh, and we show that the, the financial industry has operated on several uh, dimensions pensions to channel pension fund money into such investment vehicles. We use a qualitative inquiry into these actors to this, and we describe the, the growing links between pension funds and the financial industry as a product of shifting relationships among key actors in, in, in financial markets. So just an overview of what I'm going to present uh, in the first part, I will talk about more generally about the process of outsourcing of investments by pension funds. 
and the growth of an alternative, so-called alternative investment industry. Uh, then I, I'll, I'll discuss briefly our methodological procedures. In the third part, I will give some context on the institutional incentives to outsourcing uh, pension fund money in, in Brazil. And in the fourth part, uh, I'll, I'll then show how REITs captured or, or have been capturing uh, pension fund uh, investments in real estate over the past five years. And then I, I, I'll go to the discussion and, 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 and conclusion. Uh, so to start then, uh, I have to say that uh, the literature in, in economic geography has shown uh, that the government of the, of the investment process is a key part of uh, portfolio allocation in, uh, of pension funds. And especially the decision to, whether to invest in-house, that is the, the pension fund itself doing the investment and the governance or, uh, or else to outsource uh, the money to the financial, the financial industry and to financial specialists. Uh, uh, in different uh, uh, asset classes. And lately, pension funds have been expected to diversify their portfolios, uh, especially in a scenario of lower interest rates after 2000s in the developed, uh, in the developed world and, and also to a certain extent as I'll, we'll see in, in a country like, like Brazil. In this context, real estate has emerged as one of the one among the you know alternative investment options that include others like infrastructure and uh, private equity uh, that pension funds can invest in to, to achieve higher interest rates and and then meet their their li liabilities. Uh, we have discussed two strands of literature that. We think deserve attention in uh, in our in our discussion. One is this group of uh, studies in financial geography that have uh, addressed the process of outsourcing. Uh, in this case, we, we've seen many papers uh, of financial geography uh, uh, discussing how pension funds engage with a range of financial service providers. And in this literature, outsourcing is seen as made by asset owners, that is institutional investors, based on a number of criteria, such as costs of coordination, governance structure, internal expertise, or the lack of internal expertise, and the amounts of assets under management. Um, and in particular, in the case of alternative investments, which include those categories like real estate and infrastructure, as I said, uh, outsourcing is seen as a solution because these are asset classes that are seen as opaque. There are, you don't have much information and then it would be uh, an advantage to outsource to specialized uh, asset managers. Uh, but the fact is that in the literature, no study has, uh, no, uh, very few studies actually have focused specifically on the outsourcing within the, the real estate industry into you know, re, uh, real estate investment vehicles. The second uh, uh, literature we analyze is urban political economy, which has done more uh, specialized, more specific uh, work on REITs. Uh, a number of studies now have looked into you know, listed and non-listed REITs. Uh, and it has focused both on the broader institutional conditions that enable the growth of REITs, but also uh, in, the, in, in the way uh, property investment vehicles uh, have been shaping cities and regions to, uh, through their, their investments. And I just cite a few papers, but the, the literature has, has, now, uh, has now grown substantially. Uh, and of course, because it's an urban uh, urban studies literature, it focuses a lot on 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 this process of. Let me just uh, try to maybe uh, open up the. This is better. Uh, to to focus on the cities, but it has uh, given less attention to how capital uh, capital is pooled by REITs uh, before being invested uh, in cities. 
so we see this research gap uh, in the in the fact that while financial geographers they have addressed the relationship between pension funds and the financial industry at a more general level, uh, but not more specifically into the REIT industry. While scholars in urban political economy they have studied REITs, but they are they were more interested in the way the money was managed and invested in cities for obvious uh, reasons, but not so much. Uh, about how the REIT industry attracts and pulls capital from institutional investors, and especially in the global south, uh, where capital markets are relatively uh, nascent. So we deploy, to fill this gap, we deploy a relational approach to economic practice uh, regarding pension, pension fund decision making as embedded in shifting webs of relationships involving not only pension fund managers and asset managers, but also a range of actors like policymakers, regulators, and so on. And we see relationality as imbued with power uh, so that our research can bring into view the ability of asset manager and managers to rearrange these web of relationships to their favor and thus reshape what Young has called the relational geometries uh, underlying property investments. So a bit about uh, methodological procedures. We conducted this analysis between 2019 and 2022, uh, focusing on the asset management industry with the largest amount of pension fund money invested in uh, property uh, vehicles. We used a mixed met method approach that comprised uh, four steps. Uh, we analyze documents, reports, resolutions, uh, and uh, all the great literature about the, the, about the relationship between pension funds and asset manager, managers. Uh, we did a survey of all the investments uh, made by, by pension funds in uh, real estate investment vehicles. We collected the, the data. Then uh, we went to, we, we were, we, we carried out semi-structured interviews with asset managers, pension fund managers, consultants, regulators, about 40 interviews. And then we also participated in industry conferences, especially pension fund conferences. Uh, just to give you a bit of the, uh, the context uh, of what we are talking here in Brazil, uh, we know that in developed economy, pension fund resources are commonly delegated to the financial industry and you have there in countries like the us the uk you have a more mature industry in place to offer a range of services to pension funds so that they can uh, diversify their investments in the context of low interest rates but in brazil uh, given to uh, there are two institutional features that explain why the largest pension funds have for a long time, they have managed their resources internally instead of outsourcing to the financial industry. And we, we, we could go through them, but the, I, I'll just uh, talk quickly. Uh, the first reason is that uh, for a long time, Brazil had very high interest rates, uh, especially after inflation stabilization. And, and this made it easier for pension funds to reach their, uh, their target rates of return without having to you know, invest in a, in a large team of asset managers. So they, they, could, only, they, 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 they could only buy you know, government bonds and, 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 and do nothing uh, to, to reach their, their, their return uh, to, to meet their liabilities. And the second dimension is that state-sponsored pension funds in Brazil, they have been used to further a developmentalist agenda, especially during the PT government between 2002 and 2016, uh, uh, by investing in line with uh, government goals. So that pension funds, especially the largest one, ones which, were, which are state-sponsored, they invested directly in uh, projects, infrastructure projects that were uh, of interest to the government. This has lately changed for two reasons. The first is that interest rates has, have fallen uh, since the mid 2000s. 
uh, with occasional hikes, of course, to curb inflation. Uh, one hike in 2014, and now, and now another one. Uh, and and the second reason is that the Lava Jato operation, a car wash operation, which was a large scale judicial investigation targeting, among other actors, uh, state state sponsored pension funds. And this led to a renewed discussion in political circles uh, uh, about uh, pension fund uh, governance. So in this context, uh, context, several regulatory changes on pension funds were made during the administration of Michel Temer uh, between 2006 and 2018. And we are gonna talk about one of them because it's important for, for uh, our discussion. So just to getting to the to the more specifically to to our our empirical case, uh, it's 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 uh, important to say first that REITs uh, they had uh, two phases of growth, and in the first phase, especially in the first phase, they had grown in Brazil by attracting small retail investors. And this, I worked in a paper with Ludovic Albert uh, showing that it was a vehicle set up that, uh, for, for those small investors who enjoyed uh, tax benefits, especially in, in income tax breaks for uh, investing in, in these vehicles. So this is the, the uh, a chart showing the growth of, of REITs. You have a first uh, 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 growth uh, spurt here between 2011 and 2015, and then a second phase of growth uh, between 2018 and, and, and the last year. And this is both in terms of the number of REITs operating, which now it's more than 600, and the assets and the management in, in a in this industry. Uh, and here you have uh, the top asset managers of REITs in Brazil, uh, the total uh, value of assets under management. You have BTG, uh, Kine Investimentos, Rio Bravo Investimentos, XP Assets. Those are, uh, those are only investments in REITs. Uh, and uh, the date is the, the year is 2020, then it has grown substantially uh, since, but uh, the overall amount was 145 billion reais. Uh, so REITs have, uh, REITs have been able, have been able to grow by attracting small retails, but at some point asset managers, they have begun to realize the limits of this growth model that is to rely too much on small investors, especially because uh, small investors were uh, um, uh, scary of, uh, you know, investing in uh, uh, in, uh, in 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 such you know very volatile types of investment like uh, uh, like shares and and and, and bonds, uh, and then pension funds. Uh, emerged as a potential new source of capital to propel REITs into a second phase of growth. And this starting more or less between uh, around 2019, 2020. Uh, our argument, our key argument here is that asset managers, they were not passive uh, in this process. That is to say, they were not just offering uh, uh, investment vehicles to uh, potential investors, but they acted strategically to attract pension fund money to such vehicles through uh, three uh, actions. Uh, first, we call agenda setting and policy intervention, and then the work of chasing new clients to building networks with these uh, investors. Uh, and the third is they adapted the, the their internal governance procedures to to be able to uh, um, house this new money and 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 this new type of investor so i'm going to start with agenda setting and policy intervention the first thing that is important to say is that in 2018 the national monetary board which is a body of tied to the 
Ministry of the Economy, they issued a resolution called uh, 46661 that uh, uh, made key changes into pension fund investment regulation. And I'm gonna talk, talk about uh, the nature of those changes in a, in a moment. But what we saw through a number of interviews with those involved is that uh, there were uh, several lobbying actions taken by financial associations in the discussions of the draft of the resolution. Uh, and in particular, we found a, 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 an, an important role played by the Brazilian Associ Association of uh, Capital Market uh, Entities, or AMBIMA, uh, representing the financial sector at the uh, CMN, right? Uh, two important resolutions were introduced by, uh, uh, sorry, two important changes were introduced by the resolution 4661 that concern REITs directly. Uh, okay, sorry, I had a problem. The first one is that the resolution prohibited direct investment of, in property by pension funds. And pension funds had uh, a, a, a considerable uh, amount of money directly invested in property. This meant that pension funds had to uh, com uh, to comply with this news, the new uh, uh, ruling until 2030, and they had if if they had to sell their property uh, to other investors, it could be REITs, or they could incorporate all their their portfolio of uh, properties into new REITs or existing REITs. And this is the first dimension. And the second dimension was a change in the classification of investment classes or investment uh, um, groups within pension fund portfolio. And that in practice uh, raises the ceiling of portfolio allocation in REITs and limits competition of this vehicle with other non-property investment vehicles. And I'm, I'm gonna uh, explain uh, in more detail this in a moment. Uh, so this is a, 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 a try, we try to to represent uh, uh, this these actions, uh, both of pension funds and asset managers, uh, in the formal regulatory process that led to the approval by the National Monetary Board of this new uh, resolution. So we see that pension funds were represented by the uh, Association of Pension Funds. Uh, but they they did not uh, pose any demand on the real estate portfolio. They they posed they they posed other kinds of demands, and we see REITs also, uh, especially those asset managers I showed before, uh, they acting uh, through AMBIMA uh, to uh, uh, propose uh, some changes in the 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 ruling that would affect what pension funds could do uh, and how they could invest their money. So the, the most important one for our purposes is this one. So before uh, this ruling, uh, pension funds could invest 10% uh, of their portfolio in what is classified was classified as structured investment. That included REITs, private equity, hedge funds, and other financial vehicles. They could also invest 8% of the overall portfolio directly into property. There was a first draft of the resolution uh, that came out that made uh, basically made this change here, what, where, uh, where pension funds were prohibited from investing directly in property. But uh, other, other than that, the, the investment in the structured investment category was remained 10% of, of the portfolio. And then after uh, asset managers, especially of the REIT industry lobbied, uh, there was a change in, this, in, in these uh, uh, proportions. Uh, REITs were not part anymore of the structured investment category so that they would, wouldn't have to compete with private equity funds, with hedge funds and other financial vehicles. And they created a new category of investment uh, uh, of property investment 
that could uh, add up to 20% of pension fund portfolios, but only indirectly through REITs. So this means that REITs didn't have to compete with other uh, financial vehicles for, for the money um, of pension funds. So this, this was a, a key measure that they, that they uh, approved with this uh, uh, lobbying action. So just a, a, a quick, uh, uh, part uh, a quick extraction of, of, of an interview it was just uh, one of these S measures. He says that we, we eventually we managed to keep the segregation of the real estate segment. We asked to keep it segregated with the question of limiting comp competition. We were trying to free up more limits for other for some kinds of assets, and then the competition would, would be taken away a little bit. And it would be more favorable also for real estate investment trusts. Uh, the second uh, step uh, in, in this uh, reorganization of relations, uh, it refers to asset managers' actions to market their services to pension fund representatives. We identify two ways through which they've done so. Uh, first, by scheduling uh, recurrent meetings with pension fund managers. And second, by participating participating in conference and, and events promoted by pension organizations, and their aim was twofold. First, they wanted to purchase property assets owned by pension fund funds, who, as I said, had to sell them until 2030. And the second was to attract these clients to their newly set up investment vehicles. So this is a, a, a scheme that we try to represent this, this process that, that on the one hand, pension funds are uh, selling property to REITs, but also they buying uh, um, shares in REITs uh, so that they, uh, and on the other hand, REITs trying to, to, to buy property uh, from, from pension funds. And you have the, the overall circumstances of the car wash operation, resolution 4661, and on the other hand, declining interest rates, leading them to, to, to get closer to, leading pension funds to get close to REITs. So one of the things that uh, interviews have shown that they talk about a scramble for assets, in, and there's, there's this image that one interviewed, uh, one, one professional interviewed said, it's like a shark sniffing blood, he said that, uh, the interaction between pension funds and REITs is me and all my competitors knocking on the door of all the pension funds. So everyone is being harassed by the whole market saying, look, do you want to sell your properties uh, in a fund that will, will be managed by us? And the second uh, dimension is that asset managers have stressed very much the benefits of outsourcing to their investment vehicles in those pension fund conferences and here on the right, you have a former uh, Ministry of the Economy in the 1990s, who is also uh, a shareholder, uh, an owner of one of the asset managers, uh, Hugh Bravo, uh, promoting actually Hugh Bravo's uh, REITs in a pension fund conference. In these conferences, they usually put for the 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 REIT industry usually put for uh, four arguments that good uh, the idea of good governance of REITs the, the investing in REITs uh, means following the in the footsteps of more mature markets uh, such as the U.S. market the idea that indirect investments leads to higher returns and the fact that commercial the commercial real estate in Brazil is uh, real estate market in Brazil is is flourishing. And the third and last dimension of this is the fact that uh, pension funds have been adapting their internal governance procedures, uh, especially their routines and procedures with the, aim, with the aim of tailoring their services to institutional investors. So REITs have proved more flexible in adapting their governance to pension funds, one by setting up a, a number of internal routines and the assignment of teams to deal ex exclusively with pension funds, uh, but also through the design of exclusive financial vehicles, especially funds of funds, that is funds uh, that invest in other REITs uh, um, that are, are claimed to be more adapted to the needs of pension funds. 
And the third, the adoption of more extensive disclosure of results so that pension fund managers can oversee those investment decisions. Uh, and they claim that the amount of money held by pension funds and the difficulty of attracting and keeping these investors is what justifies hiring specialized personnel and, and creating a separate departments uh, for dealing with pension funds within weeks. Um, uh, also, it's interesting that this demand from, from pension funds lead, leads to intense discussion among the parties to set up a new vehicle. So one, one asset manager says here that we, we make a suggest, suggestion, we talk to the investor about the parameters they should think about, like concentration, liquidity, the minimum size of the fund. There is a sector that he doesn't want to invest in for some reason, so it's a forehand process and we adapt to the investment policy of pension funds. So there's this uh, attempt to, to, to adapt to what is needed, uh, what is expected actually by pension funds. So coming to the conclusion, so uh, our, our field work has shown how the decision-making of pension funds uh, is actually shaped by a network of cons constantly evolving relationships uh, um, relationships among an array of uh, economic actors. Uh, and especially we have brought to light the power of financial actors and particularly asset managers to reshuffle these networks of relationships to their benefits. Uh, and this has allowed to see us the, the process of outsourcing under a different light. It's not so much a choice among a range of investment products with clear risk and return information. And this is important because there's uh, the financial industry is, is still uh, somewhat new in Brazil. So there's a, there, it's, not a, it's not about a choice with, uh, among uh, clear investment products, but uh, the decision to invest by pension fund is largely shaped by social connections and political imperatives. Uh, this also has social, economic, and territorial implications as the asset manager, uh, management industry is largely concentrated in Sao Paulo and uh, Fabio Contel uh, recently wrote about this. And also the fact that the investment in real estate, they often reflect uh, some narrow priorities. And I, I showed this in a, a previous paper with uh, Ludovic Albert. <laughs> And also by showing how REITs devise new strategies to attract institutional capital, we, we also demonstrate that the financial industry cannot be seen as a homogeneous entity. There are a number of, invest, uh, of financial players and some are more capable of attracting institutional capital than others. From a policy and from a policy pers perspective, our, works, uh, our work puts into question the 2010s uh, pro-market environment, policy environment that has uh, made pension funds increasingly dependent on a small number of financial intermediaries. Finally, theoretically, uh, by drawing on this relational uh, approach, we were able to show how the pooling of money by financial institutions is politically and socially constructed and how it affects the topology of, of money flows in, in, in Brazil. Thank you so much. Uh, if some of you want, I can share uh, our, our paper. Uh, it's not out yet, but uh, we can share uh, uh, a working paper in, for anyone who's interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, and also Mayra for co-authoring the paper that the presentation is based on. Uh, so great presentation. I'm, I'm looking forward to see what the discussion will lead to. You stick very well to the time we gave you. So that means we have quite a bit of time for, for Q&A, almost 25 minutes. I know it's always difficult to ask the first question. So I'm going to ask the first question in a, in a few seconds myself. In the meantime, if anyone wants to ask a question, uh, you don't need to type the entire question in the chat box you can just uh, raise your hand or put in the chat box that you have a question and I will give everyone turns. And normally speaking, since we have quite a bit of time, um, I should be able to, at least the people who now indicated they have a question that should be possible. Okay, so while people are lining up their questions, my first question is a little bit about the international dimension of this. So what we know about diversification strategies of pension funds and investors more generally speaking, that it's not just 
going to indirect investment like REITs, um, and that it's also going to real estate again like REITs, but that it's also going much more internationally um, uh, diversified. So from Dutch pension funds, I know, for instance, they they have moved from direct real estate to indirect, but also from owning Dutch real estate to putting their money into American and German REITs, for instance. So there's two elements of this that I'm wondering about in the Brazilian case. The first one is, do you know of any pension funds or other institutional investors from other countries that are either already investing in these Brazilian REITs or that are being um, approached by uh, the funds in Brazil if they are approaching these international pension funds and institutional investors suggesting that they could invest in Brazil too? And on the other way, are there also some of the Brazilian pension funds that are quite active in REITs in other countries? Okay. Uh, should I respond now or are you going to? Okay. No, let, let's uh, respond now. I think it's easier to take the questions one by one. Okay. There, uh, the, for, uh, as for the first question, that, that, that's very interesting. The, the the first question about whether there are pension funds, foreign pension funds investing in Brazil's REITs, that that's uh, not there. There are not many uh, cases that we've heard, especially because uh, from a, a tax point of view, there that, that doesn't make much sense for foreigners uh, to invest in REITs in Brazil. And uh, uh, and actually, REITs in Brazil are, are very much domestic. I mean, investors are pretty much domestic. They're they're even uh, you know both individual investors and institutional investors come from uh, from the country itself. But there are pension funds investing, foreign pension funds investing in property in Brazil. What they usually do is uh, you know set up a special purpose vehicle uh, or a private equity fund. And buy into a private equity fund that then manages property uh, with a strategy that is perhaps a bit more, you know, longer term and sometimes a bit more uh, return oriented. So we found, for example, the case of the Can Canadian uh, teachers, I think, uh, pension fund. No, no, it's not. It's not the teachers. Can you correct me, Maida? <laughs> How? What's the name? <laughs> Yes, just Canadian pension fund. CPP. Okay, but the Ontario, Ontario, from Ontario, right? Was it, yes. No, it's, I think no. Yes, it's Ontario. Abroad. Okay, they 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 have several investments, but they are usually through private equity funds. They're not listed REITs, and that's a that, that's an important thing that we are mostly fo focusing on listed REITs because we have more information on, on them. On the on the reverse uh, dynamics, that is pension funds investing abroad, that is also very limited, and this has to do with the legislation. Pension funds in Brazil are not allowed to invest a, a large share of of their you know of their uh, uh, resources abroad. I, I think now it's about ten percent, and usually when they do. They invest in other types of vehicles, less risky, uh, you know, bonds, uh, some something on 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 shares of global companies in the U.S. in the U.K. So there's there's we we haven't seen anything like uh, domestic pension fund investing in 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 foreign REITs. Thank you very much. Then I'll go to Karen for the next question. Yeah, hi, and um, thank you so much for the really interesting uh, presentation, you know, uh, learning more about how REITs and pension funds in, interact right, in, in, in a very different context where I come from. So in, 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 in Asia, in Singapore, and also other Asian countries, um, the management of pension funds is also very much kind of in, in the outsourcing of these pension funds is, is much less common as well. So it's really interesting to hear how that has been handled in, in, in a country like Brazil. My question has to do more with... Um, when you're talking about that relational approach that you're taking, right, to uh, examining these uh, asset managers and, and and how they try and um, um, you know uh, influence right the ways in which uh, policy and the outcomes um, leads to this outsourcing um, of of pension funds towards REITs. And in the last slide, you also talk about kind of a 
trying to get at the topologies right, of, of these kinds of relationships. I think is when um, phrases like topology um, and also um, when you talk about a relation driven approach also makes me makes me wonder about um, issue issues of power and conflict and contestation. Um, because from from the quotes and the you know understandably very summarized right, findings that you that you presented in the middle in the middle of your talk, it, it did look it did look like a, a, a very purposeful, which is you know point taken, but also it looks like quite quite a well planned and well uh, strategized and very smooth right, and successful you know um, process. And and I was just wondering whether in the course of your research, right, through the interviews and 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 so on. Whether you you pick up on what were there, uh, what were the particular challenges or sticking points, right? Or, or were there a certain barriers that that uh, these asset managers, you know, found really difficult to navigate or, or, or circumvent? Just to kind of yeah highlight, right? There is a process. It's also it's strategic, it's purposeful, and it did achieve right much of what they set out to do. But but also where 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 are where where's the friction? Right, and and and, um, and and negotiations that that comes in. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. Thank you, Karen. It's a, that's a very interesting question, and uh, I think I, I, I should have uh, talked more about that. Uh, but uh, there, I think there are two dimensions in which there is some tensions and conflicts. The first in, it was in the policy process itself. What we've, we've gathered from interviews with pension funds is that they didn't know what, uh, why this resolution was passed. They, they weren't part of the, the discussion. Uh, they, were to, they were taken by, by surprise, actually, they say. Uh, and, they, and, and, when, and when they say that, they, 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 there's some guesswork. They, they, what they say is that, oh, you know, after all those corruption scandals, uh probably the ministry of the economy decided that it was not good for pension funds to manage directly their property because they were involved in corruption and better to you know put it to the financial industry to to do the work uh and they've it, it, they've been trying to revert this process ever since they don't want to sell their property uh because they think they think that uh from a tax point of view uh it doesn't make much sense uh they, they will have to pay Taxes for convert either if they sell or they convert into a REIT, we have to pay local taxes here in Brazil at the at the amount of it depends on the municipality, but it could go from three to to four two to four percent. So for them, they, they kind of you know they are reluctant to 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 sell for a moment, and they've been trying ever since to revert this, even though they are already. Uh, investing in REITs and making the uh, the shift uh, because they 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 don't know if this this uh, ruling is gonna fall. Uh, and the second dimension is that sometimes they they are not. I mean, what we we learn from asset managers is that they are not very um, eager to join in the in 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 some of the investment vehicles they 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 are they, they are slow to take decisions they they try they drag their feet because they think that some uh sometime in the future this ruling is gonna be struck down uh so there this is the movement that is happening but not not so i mean not so uh, 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 smooth it's not a smooth process so there is some conflict and we are trying to we've been trying to you know keep an eye on those conflicts uh, and actually don't we, we we don't we don't know if it's gonna if it, if, if it's how it's, how will it will turn out uh, maybe maybe some years in the future some some people say well uh, I, I personally think the pension funds will, will not sell much of their property because they will wait until 2028 to see if the if the if the the ruling falls and then they can keep their their property. So there, there, there that's that's what I can say. I think there is conflict and there is uh, uh, some tensions going on. Thank you. Then we have two more questions in the meantime. The first one by Claudia. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle and Maida as well for your co <laughs> collaboration here. Uh, super interesting, the, the, the presentation. And for me, it's especially interesting because uh, the time frame that you analyzed uh, is exactly the one that I stopped analyzing the same thing. You started analyzing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, from 2019 to 22. And I analyzed from 2006 until 2018, the pension funds evolution and also the REITs, the relation with it. And I, very, I'm very curious now to know what would be the representativity of uh, financial re representativity uh, of this uh, in the market, and especially the representativity of the the for, uh, the, the international uh, pension fund, international investors in it, uh, because when I I researched. Uh, when I did my research, there were none uh, uh, international. Actually, it was, as I said, it was very Brazilian. Uh, nothing, nothing. It was internal, internal money that was circulating in that. So I, I'm curious to know what what's going on now. You know, and uh, and regarding one interesting thing, I think to add, uh, including what Karen just asked, one interesting thing that I found. Uh, when I made did my research, is that those tensions with corruption did not start actually uh, at least for the the pension funds. That, at, to my point of view or from my study, it did not started uh, exactly in the uh, like so recently. Uh, it started in the scandals of corruption that happened in two thousand and eleven, which is like before. So the plan uh, the, the development of all this change was really like long and, and kind of of course a bit silent but the strategy of the state to burst the the, the financial uh, financial uh, market in Brazil which is still very like little if if you I don't know if you agree with me but uh, it was something that as I saw, uh, that started happening before uh, the corruption was before that, and then the the change of the legislation had happened in 2018. But it was a result from from something uh, that happened before, um, and also the the it is also a strategy relating the the funds coming from the state and from housing, actually, the housing, the social housing, uh, the Brazilians, the BNDES and all that. So it was a strategy a bit, in my point of view, a bit more, the, the, the roots are a bit deeper than, than this, which makes it very interesting, but well, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Yes, uh, actually there's, there, there has been several scandals uh, involving, you know, uh, state-sponsored pension funds since the '90s. Actually, so uh, yes, I think there is there's there's an, an argument that is, has built up since the the 90, 2010s, uh, but that was very much strengthened and gained legitimacy with the Lava Jato operation, uh, in the sense that pension funds. They are not. Uh, uh, they are not uh, good. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they they don't have good governance, and then and then uh, they have to be uh, regulated, or or maybe uh, uh, they have to you know outsource this to to a professional industry because otherwise they they're gonna they're gonna. Uh, Enter again into into one one scandal after after the other, so I think uh, I agree with you. I think that, that 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 comes from you know that's a longer process. But uh, I think what we claim is that the Lava Jato you know provided le legitimacy to for for the for the regulators to uh, uh, change the pension fund uh, um, 
uh, regulation. As for the how representative this is, I'm not sure if I got uh, I got your question uh, correct, but I think you you were talking about the relevance of pension funds in REITs uh, and in 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 this investment industry overall. Pension funds are you know very important uh, uh, for the industry itself. It's one, I mean, for for the overall financial market, but they are not. They are still incipient in in property investments, indirect property investments. They were the largest ones, like Previ, which is the pension fund of bankers in Banco do Brasil, and others. They were they had a long tradition of investing directly into property. So they are they are just starting to make this movement to to outsourcing. And uh, and the re and also the REIT industry is still in the beginning of transitioning from uh, an industry that is very much centered on these individual investors, small investors, into an industry that uh, 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 receives investment from institutional investors. And nowadays, like still sixty or seventy percent of the capital invested in REITs comes from individual investors and. And uh, it's only recently that uh, institutional investors have uh, started to, you know, uh, uh, get a larger share of this of this industry. I I don't know if I respond to that, and maybe. I think so. Yes. Um, if there's a follow-up question, then uh, then Claudia can always ask it. But in the meantime, I'll go to a question for my co-organizer, uh, Sabina Duri. <laughs> thank you, Manuel, and thank you, Myra and Daniel, for this uh, extremely dense and insightful uh, talk. Well, nothing else um, am I uh, uh, or do I know from you? So um, let me, I have two questions, actually. One, the first one you probably covered, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, probably didn't get it, get it. Do you have a comparison of the performance of REITs and pension funds invested in REITs? So the performance in, in the same asset class, but how they literally managed. I'm not really sure you have these kind of like comparison that would be just out of interest. And the other one, I think I find it quite intriguing, the story you you actually um, rehearsed or you, it unfolded here. Uh, you, it is this kind of like shift from retail investors towards institutional investors. And you said, well, actually um, that doesn't really, or well, institutional investors, don't necessarily benefit from tax benefits or something like that. Potentially, so, so but this is an observation, so I'm asking you, uh, I would doubt that. Um, I'm just having just dissected this kind of like complex um, private equity funds in my in, in the latest regional studies paper, which came just out. I would actually say perhaps this kind of shift is also a power shift and institutional investors lobbied the government to actually um, um, encourage this kind of shift because you don't get the tax benefits from selling or from trading properties, but from the legal structure of the funds. And you mentioned funds of funds or private equity, which you can legally structure in order to shift benefits or benefit from much, much larger taxation gains, which you can then you know, literally channel through this kind of like very complex um, fund structures. So that is perhaps um, an observation I would just like to ask you whether I'm totally wrong or perhaps that was also an, uh, well, I don't know, a, a big push factor towards this kind of like um, new legislation being introduced. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. Very interesting question. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to <laughs> To answer you uh, uh, as you expected, but uh, uh, the first one, as, uh, uh, as for the performance of REITs and 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 pension funds directly investing, we don't have the data on that. But it's interesting that one of the in the interviews there 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 was one that usually I I remember that that one. One of the asset managers, he said, he was asked uh, why uh, pension funds were investing in, were not investing in in REITs enough, 
And one of the things he said is that, well, because, you know, you, if you have, if you know how to do something uh, and most large pension funds know how to invest in property, why would you pay someone to, to do it for you? So <laughs> he, he was kind of saying that uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense for them. And, and, and that's what they claim. They have internal expertise. They know how to, you know, uh, uh, and to deal with property and uh, from a cost perspective, it's still not clear for them uh, that, that it's an advantage. And there is international liter literature that has tried to make this comparison between, we, between you know, uh, property vehicles and direct investment. And they have shown in other countries, of course, I don't know if it's not valid for Brazil, but uh, they have shown that it's not very much of an advantage for for uh, investing through these vehicles, and when I when I said about the the tax uh, advantages, I what I meant is that there are two dimensions. The one is the fact that from a tax point of view, the the transition is not good for pension funds. That is, if you have a portfolio of uh, property that you already own and you have to trans uh, tr transfer it to uh, a REIT structure, then you have to pay local taxes on property uh, exchange. And this, you know, they say it would be too costly. But the vehicle itself, if you're entry for the first time, uh, if you're investing new money into the vehicle, then I think, yes, it makes sense for them, at least from a tax point of view. I'm, I'm not very expert on this, but, they, but I think we can say this would wouldn't be a problem. Their problem is to you know shift from direct to indirect uh, in a portfolio they already own. Thank you very much, Daniel. I see there's no more questions from the participants. I have a short question myself. You mentioned that you focus primarily or maybe exclusively on the listed funds. If I see the graph earlier on, if I read it well, but it went quite fast, there were like many hundreds of different REITs in Brazil. So how many more or less of them are listed? And the strategies to describe, are they typical for all listed REITs or are they typical only for the biggest of the listed REITs? Sorry, uh, what, what was the last question, the, the typical? If the strategies you describe, are they typical for all the listed REITs oh, okay. or only for the biggest ones of them? Because I can imagine if there's so many, some of them are not able to tap into institutional capital. Great, great, great question, uh, Manuel. Yeah, uh, there's a great number of REITs because, uh, first of all, because in the beginning of the industry, REITs were, there are many REITs that were, you know, consisted of only one property. I mean, you just created a, a REIT uh, to put inside uh, one building or one shopping mall and then sell uh, to investors. And beginning in the 2010s, there emerged a number of larger REITs uh, with, listed in the, in the stock exchange with a diversified por portfolio. And so we have an industry that is, there are many REITs, but some are, uh, now reaching largest uh, a larger scale and with you know uh, a very diversified port portfolio, uh, and I and I think that there is uh, uh, this the industry itself as as the question of listed on non listed when when we talked uh, when we discuss about pension funds investing in REITs, uh, many of these REITs are not listed. They are you know they are sometimes they are setting up. REITs, especially non-listed REITs, especially for pension funds uh, to invest uh, in, uh, in all kinds of, of, of property and pension funds prefer actually non-listed REITs, especially because, you know, listing, you know, with the ups and downs of uh, capital markets in Brazil, uh, it would affect their balances uh, at the end of the year. They will have, you know, go one year they will go up and then you go fall down. So they, they usually prefer um, non listed REITs and they prefer uh, vehicles that are they that whose share, shareholders are only institutional investors. They, they don't want to be in vehicles with, you know, uh, small investors who, uh, you know, they put money into the 
vehicle and then there is when there's a small fall in in share prices they they get out and then you know you go up and down all the time so they they prefer these kinds of vehicles in the in the in the charts i think we had all the vehicles there uh we had all the vehicles both listed and non-listed but we have more information about listed uh, of course, because non-listed vehicles do not have the requirements to, you mm -hmm. know, to to share information, to disclose information. Can I add something? If, if I yeah. may, I sure. yes, yeah. yes, just regarding uh, your question. I think uh, when you made a question about if it's the only the largest, the ten largest pension funds, or the whole of them, I see two strategies. I think the ten largest asset houses. Uh, uh, in rule, like they are betting in this type of strategy because they need to increase their money on their management, of course. But uh, you also have some, I'm not going to say small houses, but medium sized houses who are just betting on institutional investors. So they are only focusing on this type of investors because uh, it's the only, uh, I mean, if they get one pension fund to invest on them, they will be okay for the rest of some years, you know? So there are these two uh, types of, of things. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's very good. You're yeah. one, of the, one of the authors of the paper, so it's good to, uh, to add a little bit. Claudia, I'm sorry, I cannot give you the floor anymore because we need to round up, but maybe you can, you can drop to Danielle or Mayra a quick email. Thanks everyone for attending, especially thanks to Danielle and also for Mayra for, for writing the paper and presenting us to us. So as I mentioned, uh, we have a whole series coming up. Um, I put the link in the chat, you can find it there. And the next speaker will be in exactly two weeks from today, same time. Uh, not exactly the same place, but we're staying in Brazil for the next speaker. So it's Fabio Bettioli Contel, uh, our ambassador for Latin America, uh, will be presenting. So uh, we look very forward. Uh, we, we look forward very much also to his lecture. Uh, and then if you look online, you can find the other ones as well. Uh, Sabine, my co-organizer, will be chairing the next session, uh, but I will be there as well. Okay, thanks everyone, and again, thanks especially Daniel and Maida. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will stop the recording now. Thank you. Bye-bye.